being discriminated against by our own nation because we are black. Not because we're Indian, but because we are black. We have black blood. We are counting every year for the money that they get for all the government programs. And they vote us out every year of those programs. In 2014, they cut us off our medical because we are black. And they say we have the wrong cards. Well, I say who gave us those cards is our nation. And they know we belong there. And those cards should be fixed if they need to be fixed. But they cut us off of our medical. We need our chief and all the administration to stop discriminating against their own people. We're here to fight and stand for our nation. We are Seminoles with black blood, and we are proud of it. And they have to accept it for what it is. It's against the Constitution of the United States of America, and it's also against the Constitution of Seminole Nation, and they're breaking their own laws. And we are here today because we're asking the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, to help us in this cause to help us come out and stand with us and investigate our nation for the problem that they're having right now with the blackness of our skin and the crook in our hair. We are Seminoles and we will always be Seminoles. We were born Seminoles, we will die Seminoles and we stand for Seminole Nation. We're asking the BIA to do their job and investigate Seminole Nation for discrimination. Very powerful words there coming from Laetta Osborne Sampson, who is a member of the Seminole Nation Council from the Cesar Bruner Band. Uh, welcome to Burn It Down with Kim Brown, everybody. Happy holiday week to you here. And that clip from Laetta basically symbolizes the frustrations that many Black Native Americans feel towards their home nations, their, their Indian tribes, their, their native nations to which um, they belong, um, to which they were born in, they inherited uh, this Native American heritage, and they still are experiencing discrimination, being treated as less than, um, citizenship being denied, benefits being denied. In today's program, we're gonna talk about the double struggle of being black and being indigenous in America. And I think today is a super appropriate day to have that conversation. Um, so I would like to bring in a great panel. I'm very excited about today's program, everybody. By the way, don't forget, go to Burn It Down with Kim Brown's YouTube, cha YouTube channel and hit subscribe if you don't mind. Um, this is where you're going to find these kinds of conversations right here brought to you by The Real News. Uh, but I'd like to welcome our panel because um, this is a conversation that needs to be had often and repeatedly uh, because there are oppressed and marginalized groups even within oppressed and marginalized groups. And Black Native Americans um, have had this experience for hundreds of years now. So let me welcome our panel. First of all, familiar face right here, the new host, co-host of the forthcoming program here on The Real News, The Colonized News Hour. She's also an indigenous activist and journalist. Johnny J is joining us today. We're also being joined today with Antonio Cosme. Antonio is a radical indigenous economist and activist. He's also a beekeeper with Southwest Bee Detroit. Um, he's an educator with the National Wildlife Federation and also a gardener with the Southwest Grows. He organized with the Detroit Indigenous Peoples Alliance and uh, to end Columbus Day and to remove the Columbus statue in downtown Detroit. We're happy to have Antonio back on the program. And we're joined today also with Marilyn Van. Marilyn is the president of the Descendants of Freedmen of the Five Civilized Tribes Association and the African Indians of the Five Civilized Tribes Foundation. She was a litigant in the federal lawsuits Van v. Zinke and Cherokee Nation v. Nash, which reaffirmed the 1866 treaty rights of Black Cherokee freedmen tribal members to retain their rights to tribal membership within the Cherokee Nation. Uh, Ms. Van, she also, she has a very uh, extensive resume here. She also, um, she and her organization continue to fight 
racism and apartheid perpetuated against persons of African ancestry who are members or descendants of members of the five civilized tribes. So panel, um, thank you all so much for making time to talk about this important topic today. We appreciate you being here. Oh, thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Wonderful. I'm glad to be here. Well, Marilyn, I'm so happy to have you here. You're joining us today from Oklahoma, and I think that's where I want us to begin this conversation. Um, many people, I don't think, are super familiar with the experience of Black Native Americans. If you could, could you give us sort of a, a brief history of how Black Native Americans came to be and the sort of, of discrimination that they have historically face not only from larger America, but within their native tribes. And what, what are some of those issues look like today? Okay. The uh, majority of the Blacks of the five tribes, and I'm talking about Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, Choctaw, and Seminole Nation, um, have got uh, received certain rights uh, based on 1866 treaties, which are signed between those tribes and the government. Now, prior to that, uh, the majority of the uh, persons who were living in those tribal reservations prior to the Civil War with African ancestry were uh, were living as slaves. Uh, those, uh, and some people find that hard to believe. But there are very there are many public documents which prove that uh, constitutions of tribes such as the Cherokee Nation, which uh, talk about slavery, which uh, outline the discrimination against persons of African descent, the Creek Nation Tribal Code, the Choctaw Nation, Chickasaw Nation. I mean, it, it's clear that it, that it is there, and as I said, these are public documents. Even the uh, and in those tribes. Um, you know, that uh, there were plantations, uh, you know, black people, as I said, were enslaved. Now, that doesn't mean every person with African descent was, was, was a slave at the time of the Civil War. The majority of them were. There were some free blacks that were li legally living uh, in the tribes. Uh, a few had citizenship, even. But that's not the majority of the people. Um, and it, it wasn't necessarily an easier slavery, uh, especially when you talk about the Choctaw and Chickasaw nations, than what was going on in the Deep South. The, even the reason that, the, that these tribes joined the Confederacy was to keep Black people permanently enslaved. So when the, um, um, so, uh, you know, a white person, uh, had all kinds of rights to be able to come into, you know, different tribes, set up businesses, marry, marry an Indian, um, all kinds of things that a black person, a free black person even, you know, just wasn't allowed to do. Now, after the uh, Civil War, again, you have these treaties, which uh, in your Cherokee, Creek, and Seminole tribes, those tribes agreed to adopt the free and citizens. Within the treaties with, with the Choctaw and Chickasaw tribes, the people, um, it, it gave those tribes the option to adopt the freedmen. And if they did, they would receive funds from the United States government. Um, so, you know, that doesn't mean that after this, between Civil War and Oklahoma statehood, there was no discrimination at all. But there was still, um, but there were still some. Um, a white person coming into the tribe still had better privileges, but things were certainly much better than in the Deep South um, um, in, in the Indian tribes. But the things that were things really started getting off the trail again was when the U.S. government put more and more pressure on the tribes to a lot divide the tribal lands. And the um, um, and and so the so the the, the men from D.C. came in. They used the tribal roles, but um, instead of just registering people by families, they they decided, well, we're going to use this blood quantum to uh, to determine when people's land would be sellable. So they would they decided if someone was a quarter blood, a half blood, of this and that, and the other, 
things that Indian tribes across the country had never used. I mean, nobody sitting here has an American blood quantum. I mean, I mean, the whole thing would have been unheard of, unthought of. But, you know, there's people that live and die, you know, based on the number that's on a card. Well, people of almost all people of African descent in the tribes were listed on the Freedmen sections of the Dawes Rolls, which didn't list a blood quantum for them. It didn't mean that people didn't have Indian blood. It didn't mean there wasn't a tribal role that said that they had Indian ancestry. But anyway, this is what the, what the tribes are using now to register people. So when Oklahoma became a state, and Oklahoma was mostly um, people from the Deep South came to Oklahoma at the time, before statehood. And mostly invaders, people coming in here, sneaking in on land runs. They set up these Jim Crow laws in the Oklahoma Constitution that said anyone with a drop of African blood was legally a Negro, subject to Jim Crow laws. Uh, anybody that had no African blood was legally white. So the tribes again began to shift, you know, toward anti-blackness. Now, I'll tell you, the tribes were not really functioning as governments, um, you know, right after Oklahoma statehood. So uh, nobody was being registered. The, the, the chief was being appointed. The tribal government, the, the tribal legislatures really were not meeting. But then you start coming to the, into the 1970s where the federal government begins to allow the tribes to exercise more sovereignty. There's laws passed. Um, and, um, and so then when you start getting into later years, um, as the tribes get more wealth, there's movements to try to put the blacks out. Um, the, uh, the problem started in the Cherokee Nation when the freedmen tribal members didn't want to vote for uh, the, the chief at that time when he was running again, Ross Swimmer. So he, the way he decided to do, well, I'll just block these people from voting. Uh, in other tribes, like the Creek Nation, uh, the chief, um, I think it was like 1979, um, the members of the tribe were going to get a large payment of money from the federal government. So, you know, rather than share this with the freedmen, it's, well, let's put them out here. So the, uh, so there was a constitution to put the people out. So, you know, it's just been a fight ever since with the Cherokees. As I said, there wasn't a tribal constitution that allowed them to put the freedmen out, but basically the freedmen were not being registered. They weren't being allowed to vote. And um, the so ultimately this, um, you know, there was litigation. I was a federal litigant. Um, there were some lawsuits in tribal court. Um, the... Um, um, so then, for a short period of time, there was some registration of freedmen, but the chief uh, set up a movement. By this time, we have Chad Smith to put the freedmen out. He had an illegal con um, he had an illegal petition, used tribal funds, tribal employees, all of this. You know, a lot of nobody said we're going to kick the N I G blank blank out publicly. But it was, you know, well, these people, they're going to take all the money. They're going to use up the money. They're only used and interested in benefits. And the tribe is full of people who don't know anything about the treaties. They don't know anything about tribal history. Almost the vast majority of people are completely Caucasian looking in the tribe. Not just a Cherokee nation. The Choctaw and Chickasaw nations, too. But as I said, there's been a lot of anti-blackness. and. You know, and just to show the difference, there are other adopted classes of people in the Cherokee Nation. There was a band of Delaware and a band of Shawnee that were adopted in the tribe. Um, it's back in the old country before the removal, there were quite a few Creek Indian people who received citizenship in the Cherokee Nation. There's never been a movement to throw any of those people out, only the freedmen people. So this, um, so clearly it's a matter of color and people using a race card to gain and keep power. Um, you know, so that is, um, that's a lot of what's, you know, it has been going on. Um, you know, you get people, um, even though, for instance, it, it's not like 
uh, what was going on in Mississippi, Alabama, where you had lynchings of people or, uh, you know, homes being, you know, burnt down by somebody like the Klan. Not to say that there were not, there were Klan members who were members of Indian tribes, completely white looking people in the, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, some became Klan leaders here. But I'm, I'm just saying there wasn't that kind of violence. What's really been used in more modern times against the freedmen has been economic power. Um, if, if you are a tribe that's getting billions of dollars a year from casinos and hundreds of millions of dollars for the federal government to run programs, you know, you can go and buy newspapers and put your truth out there. You can, the federal government will pay for, you know, your attorneys because you can get a, a um, grant from the Department of Justice to run a legal department. Um, and so even though like in the Cherokee Nation, after about 17 years of litigation, we finally were able to get our rights confirmed, um, reconfirmed by a federal judge, you still have some people running departments or the like that they don't want the freedmen there. They may slow down a free per, freedman person getting a benefit or a service, although um, that's not um, that's not something that uh, Mr. Hoskin or Mr. Uh, Baker, who is a former chief, uh, something that they support. Um, the the but the bottom line is there's discrimination uh, that's going on, and we were just talking. You showed something there about Leetta Osborne Sampson, a very close friend of mine. That is the Seminole Nation. They are, um, you know, after losing a lawsuit about the freedmen, that what they decided to do is, well, we'll just reissue them cards, um, you know, and put on the back um, voting purposes only. They block the people from getting services. They try to get other tribes not to allow them to get services in their medical clinic. Um, the, uh, when, uh, they, uh, an outside attorney general for the tribe told them that, you know, this discrimination, this kind of discrimination needed to end. They cursed the man, they threatened him. This is what the camera's running in the council house. And the chief, you know, um, agreed with the attorney, uh, the chief at that time agreed with them, um, agreed that the, that the discrimination needed to stop. Some of the people, they jumped up, shouted it called him an NIG lover, all of this kind of stuff. And it's, it's uh, you know, so, you know, all of the, I'm not talking about things that happened 100 years ago. I'm talking about things that have been happening a year ago, three years ago, five years ago. Um, so, and, and you have a lot of, you know, just talking about the uh, petition. Well, hold on, hold on. Before yeah. you get to the petition, Marilyn, hold on. <laughs> this, uh, you, you gave us a, a lot to process there, a lot of history. Uh, for, for Basically, you almost gave us like 150 years worth of history in about 10 minutes, so that was pretty amazing. Uh, Johnny J., I, I want to I wanna punt to you, if I could, because... You know, uh, you you are a native woman with with a multi nation uh, in your heritage, and I know some of those names that we heard um, are indeed your your nations. I wanted to ask, you know, how is this history taught? How did you come to know about the freedmen? How black people were part of Native American tribes, and what were the the attitudes that you experienced as a native woman learning about? The, the, the black part of, of Native American tribes, but also, you know, how these freedmen, um, number one, they view themselves as natives, um, but how do, how, how was that instructed to you? How was that imparted upon you and how did you re receive this information? I'm curious. It wasn't. Um, that history is not taught from a cultural standpoint. Like I grew up learning about my Choctaw culture um, I grew up within my communities, within my family, and I never even heard of the freedmen until I was probably, geez, 32. And that was because of what was going on in Oklahoma at the time with the freedmen going to court to try and fight for their rights and the Cherokee Nation um, trying to, you know, disenroll the freedmen people from their tribe. So that was how I learned about it was from what, what the media was covering at the time. But other than that, it was not something that was taught or even talked about. 
And it's really strange now um, because when you look at the tribes, the five civilized tribes, they have they were some of the earliest tribes to be assimilated heavily. And that's why they're called the five civilized tribes. And we have adopted a lot of ways that have really kind of upheld white supremacy. And like Marilyn was saying, like we have Chathas who were clan leaders we, that were willingly fighting on the side of the Confederacy. For some of the five civilized tribes, they were forced into um, choosing to side with the Confederacy. But there were tribes that willingly decided to be like, hey, we're going to do this just for the reason that Marilyn said. They want to continually keep Black people oppressed. And it was a way to kind of uphold that kind of racial hierarchy, I guess you would say, um, and kind of think, kind of like believe like, oh, well, if we act more like the white man, then they're going to treat us better. And that's not the way it was, because also when I started learning about the Freedman history, a lot of people, like when I would start asking questions, a lot of the narrative was that it was a more benevolent slavery, that it wasn't as violent or as horrible as it was for like white men owning black people. Like it was taught as a benevolent slavery. And I actually bought into that narrative until I started learning about the history from the freedmen themselves and, you know, reading the history that they were able to put together. And it's like, oh, so, you know, everything that I was taught is totally wrong here. And there's a lot of nuance that goes into it because when you look at the history of the U.S., Native people, Black people, this country was founded on our blood and through our labor. And, you know, there's a lot of, I guess you would say, there's a lot of um, writing on it, on keeping us divided and keeping us apart. So throughout history, like we have had to make some horrible decisions in order to survive, but that's not an excuse. <laughs> like, in, it's not an excuse now. Like we can say, oh yeah, well, you know, they wanted our tribe to survive and this was a way to do it because for the five civilized tribes, being heavily assimilated meant that native women were raped, stolen and sold into marriages with white men so that they could gain power within our tribe because of the way that our kinship systems work. And you start looking about how that kind of started to play a part in like now, a lot of our people are very white passing and they act very white. Um, Choctaw tribe is one where, you know, there is a lot of colorism. There's a lot of issues that arise even for us non-Black natives where we are kind of discriminated against because we're a little bit darker, um, because we want to be more traditional, because the Choctaw Nation has been very assimilated to the point where um, a lot of our spiritual history has been lost. And you look at our taglines now for the tribe and it's like faith, culture, family. But the faith that they're talking about is the Christian faith. And if you talk to a lot of Choctaw people, like they talk about our spirituality as if we were always Christian people, as if we were always just very kind of white. <laughs> and even with the Trail of Tears, you know, before we started walking the Trail of Tears, people think we were leaving like little huts and traditional villages, but that's not true. We were leaving huge plantations. We are leaving cities and those were being taken over by white people that were allowed to move in once we were forcefully <laughs> removed. And, you know, again, the freedmen had to walk that trail of tears with us. They had to go through the same horrendous atrocities that native people were going through. And a lot of that, it kind of plays into the idea of, well, they suffered with us. So, you know, we kind of weren't as harsh with them as we were to other people or as white people were to black people. And that's not true because there is no benevolent slavery. There's no nonviolent slavery at all. And even with our history, you know, that's not something that we could just brush under the rug and be like, well, you know, we had to make some hard decisions. We did, but that does not mean that we are free from the consequences of that. And mm -hmm. when it comes to the freedmen, you know, it's, to me, they are Choctaw, they are Seminole, they're Chickasaw, they're, you know, Creek, without a doubt. Like, I don't even think there should be freedmen roles and tribal roles. They should be on the same role because regardless of the circumstances, the minute that our people decided to bring them into our communities, they made them Choctaw, they made them Chickasaw and Seminole. The minute we started sharing our languages, our cultures, our traditions, and bringing them in, you know, that through our kinship systems, that is how you become Choctaw. Because, you know, in a lot of Native people, we always say it's not just blood that makes you Native. It's that connection that we have to our communities, to 
our languages, our traditions, our cultures, like that is what makes us who we are. And we always talk about our identities not being racial, but socio-political. And that's what I see going on right now with the freedmen. They should be, you know, citizens of our tribes without a doubt, without hesitation, and not denied their birthright. Because, you know, there are a lot of Black natives who are native by blood. And again, you know, the same reason that there's a lot of white people who are native by blood that find it, you know, that comes from a lot of rape, that comes from, you know, being sold into slavery and being sold to people. Like there's a lot of things that go into this identity and nuance that gets lost. And it's so frustrating to me because despite all of that, like these are our people. Like these are Choctaw people. These are Seminole people. These are our knowledge keepers, our language keepers. And they carry our history with them as much as we do. And it's so frustrating because there's so much anti-Blackness in Indian country that even outside of the five civilized tribes, we have to confront that daily with people Mm. saying, well, they're not native by blood. And it's like, well, you don't know the history here. Like they are native by blood. They're native by culture. In every way that you can be considered native, they are. And so... It's, it's so frustrating to me just because this history kind of gets swept under the rug. And even now with Deb Holland coming into being um, Secretary of Interior, I can't remember. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, bringing up these issues, like I didn't know that she had supported policy that intentionally excluded the freedmen until I saw a Twitter account, the Choctaw and... Um, Chickasaw like, freedmen. You can thought Friedman, you know, tweeting about it. And I was like, oh, holy crap. Like, how did this escape my notice? Because I do keep up with the news in any country. And to see that policy and to see how they were um, previously included and that this reauthorization intentionally excluded them just blew my mind because it speaks to how non-civilized tribes, how natives view Black natives and how they view Friedman. And it's a very contentious issue, even, you know, within Oklahoma, because it's so divided. Like, I get put on the outs quite a bit for, you know, supporting the freedmen just unconditionally, like they are our people. And just saying that is controversial, and it shouldn't be. Wow. Well, ho- hold on right there, Johnny J, because I do want us to circle back to uh, Congresswoman Deb Holland, uh, I believe the first Native woman to ever be elected to Congress. She's under consideration by the Biden administration um, for a cabinet position to be Secretary of the Interior, and uh, that's bringing up a lot of questions. But before we go there, Antonio, you know, both Johnny and Marilyn brings up um, the history of and, and the continued practice of, of anti-Blackness um, from Indigenous people towards Black people. And this summer, you know, we saw a lot of solidarity between Indigenous activists and Black Lives Matter activists um, because, you know, we, we have a shared oppression on this continent, although it is different in different experiences. Um, but how do these anti-Black attitudes, despite you know, our obvious solidarity, you know, we see them still resurfacing as the the woman who spoke at the beginning of the show, um, Laetta um, Osborne Sampson, the Black Seminole woman, talking about how the Seminole are systemically um, disenfranchising their Black members of benefits that they rightly deserve. So talk to me about how you have seen or experienced um, anti-Blackness as an Indigenous man towards Black folks. Yeah, so uh, I'm Kowa Wiltakan in Boricua. So I, my ancestors are, um, you know, Taino in uh, the Caribbean, as well as, uh, you know, Spanish and Greek and a lot of mixtures of things. And then Kowa Wiltakan is where my father is from in South Texas. Uh, and we were um, colonized by the Spanish. Uh, and a lot of our peoples were kind of absorbed into the Spanish colonial mission communities. But I just wanted to give my background a little bit to introduce myself. Um, but I'm a native of De- native of Detroit. I live in Detroit, um, and up here, as you go north, and in my, apparently I'm learning, you know, about the tribes out uh, in the southeast. But as you go north, native indigenous communities get a lot more light skin. Um, and as we were working on uh, this campaign. You know, I, I don't typically talk about this sort of like inner politics, but I think it's relevant for this conversation. Um, 
But as we were working on this campaign to end Indigenous Peoples Day, um, we live in Detroit, and I am very much of the values of these women on this panel, where our idea is we have to connect the historic uh, anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity that's at the heart of the United States logic. Red lands plus black labor equals white gold. We have to connect that racial ancestral history with the work that's happening now and with contemporary movements and contemporary problems. Uh, Detroit is the blackest major city in the entire country. Uh, it was taken over uh, through this process of emergency management where we had our water system stripped away, our democracy taken away. Um, and we really wanted to connect all of those things together. So a lot of us who are in this committee um, decided to make it Indigenous and African Peoples Day. And that was the plan, um, just to make it very relevant to the 80% Black city, the Blackest major city in the entire country. Um, and we, and there's, there are no tribes in the city, but there is uh, a large uh, Native American nonprofit. And um, with leaders within that nonprofit, uh, opposed our efforts to make it Indigenous and African Peoples Day. Uh, and for me, like as somebody who, uh, it's, it was strange because I'm not in Anishinaabe, but I'm in Anishinaabe land. And uh, Anishinaabe people are kind of like bossing up on me and telling me like, you know, um, it can't, it's gotta be just Indigenous Peoples Day, like we're doing it all over the country. And for me, I'm like, yo, Columbus came to my ancestors' lands well before he made it like he never came up here. This is not like, you know, this isn't like a, an identity politic that y'all like have, you know, any sort of like say in. Like you shouldn't be come making like the solidarity that we're building. You shouldn't oppose um, because it, it's more powerful. You know, it's it's more relevant. Um, we ended up because it was such a big divide within the committee, and when the Anishinaabe, some of the Anishinaabe folks uh, spoke out on it. Um, a lot of other people in the committee backed down because, you know, they didn't have, like, there were black people, there was, you know, mixed people, like, mixed people of Mesoamerican ancestry like myself. So it was like, yeah, it was, it became, it's, it stymied the project for two years. Um, and we finally just, like, went ahead and did it and make an Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, and as an alternative, uh, I started this thing called the Decolonial Solidarity Feast, which we didn't do this year because of COVID. Um, but it's a, it's like something we're doing the day before Indigenous Peoples Day, where we bring together Black and uh, Native people uh, to build on that shared history, that shared legacy. And uh, it's really, really unfortunate um, that anti-Blackness bleeds so deeply into Indigenous communities. I, I see it. Um, there's a perennial question within all Indigenous community of who is or who isn't. This is like an, a, across the entirety of the United States, um, and I'm sure all over settler societies, um, there tends to be this conversation of who is and who isn't. Is it, if you did, grew up in the culture, if you grew up in cities, if you grew up on the res, uh, if you if you were adopted out, you know who who's native? Like, can they prove it? Um, people are fake native, fake veteran. Like, it's a perpetual, exhausting conversation that happens all over native country. Um, but particularly where you find uh, the indigenous folks overlapping with whiteness in a great degree, you're gonna find higher, higher amounts of anti-blackness more generally. And I think it's really important if we look at the roots of this, it's, it's capitalism. It's uh, the United States sort of like ideology, culture, bleeding into taking you know, precedent over uh, you know, more traditional ancestral ideologies around race and, and, and belonging. Um, and I think it's really noteworthy what exactly it was, um, the attributes of the five uh, civilized tribes that made them, you know, uh, gain, gain acceptance by the federal government. Uh, that's accepting private property, uh, living in European style built homes, adopting settler agricultural practices, adopting Christianity adopting centralized governments, uh, you know, in the style of the United States more, in European folks more, um, having uh, literacy and educational things happening in English, which means kind of like stamping out your native uh, languages and cultures, 
participating in the in the market exchange of capitalism in that in those terms, uh, writing constitutions, uh, breeding with white people, and key for this part of the country, plantation and slavery practices. Um, and I think that's something that like you can't kind of ignore because uh, it's in the United States interest to perpetually grow people who identify with the settler system, uh, anti-blackness, slavery, um, US, uh, European American settler uh, land management practices. Uh, it's in their interest to get more and more people adopted to those ways taking people who were uh, in the Anishinaabe case, um, a lot of the Northern Anishinaabe folks were not planters, but taking them and keeping them and making them set entry people. Um, that's all part of it. And uh, I think a lot of the anti-blackness comes from adopting to that culture uh, and also you know, wanting to adapt yourself to the United States. And it's inherent in the United States that as people become Americanized, as people become uh, even for white people, you know, when they lived in their ethnic enclaves, they slowly moved towards uh, becoming white, becoming American. And almost always that practice included uh, for Irish people, for, for instance, in New York and Boston, becoming a cop and reinforcing anti-blackness. Whereas they weren't white when they came, in order to be white, you have to adopt anti-blackness. Uh, there's a long history of Irish people who were colonized by England of so like there's a group called the San Patricios and they were fighting in the um, uh, Spanish American War and they actually betrayed uh, the United States because when they were marching on Mexico they recognized that yo damn we're fighting for England and we're Irish people <laughs> this isn't right so they actually betrayed the United States and joined Mexico and fought for Mexico uh, the San Patricios um, so like to go from there to becoming cops and becoming like, you know, all this stuff you'd see in, you know, Irish Boston movies, there's a streak of them that were popular for a while. Um, but it's just part oh, of Americanization. Oh, absolutely. And, and I appreciate you raising that point, Antonio, about, you know, who's native and who isn't. And I think that's really the, the integral argument um, that at least from, from a person on the outside looking in, it appears as though that is what, the, the struggle of the Black Native Americans is right now in 2020 about who is Native and who isn't. And as Laetta um, Osborne Sampson at the top of the show talked about, you know, the Seminole want to count us when it's time to swell the rolls and receive federal dollars. But when it's time to distribute those resources, uh, we get cut off. And, and Marilyn, I, I want to circle back to you about that point, because, I mean, does this really come down to money? Does this come down to, to, to capitalism in a sense where uh, Black Native Americans are being, help me out with the term, is the term disenrolled from, from tribal roles um, to, in order to, d to deny them the benefits and services that they are entitled to? Is that, is that the argument or the case here? Yes, yes. Um, a lot of this really comes down to money, the dollar, um, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, even when it came back to the treaties, uh, let's just talk about the Choctaw Nation. When they, when they pushed for a treaty that said if the freedmen were adopted, they'd be limited to 40 acres of land, the freedmen, and the tribe would have to be paid. Well, when the Dawes Rose were made and the allotments were done, everybody else in the tribe, including white men who had only been married to an Indian woman for a year or two, got 320 acres of land. So then, you know, as I said, you jump into the early 1980s where the Choctaws have a, a constitution that, um, that they didn't allow the freedmen to even vote on um, to uh, put the freedmen out. So, all, for instance, the Choctaw Nation uh, got hundreds of millions of dollars in COVID-19 relief money. The freedmen didn't get any of that money. You know, none of the job training, none, none of that stuff, you know, none of the programs are the freedmen able to participate in. As I said, even with your Seminole Nation, uh, yes, it, it beefs up the tribe's money for the head count. And again, they got hundreds of millions of dollars, too. But then when it comes to sharing the money, no, the, free, the freedmen need to get out and need to go to the back of the bus. And as I said, you know, um, these council meetings 
just talk about the Seminole Nation. Um, we're, uh, you know, the council has voted the freedmen not to share in this and not share in that. Um, these are the these are the private records. These programs, the housing programs, for instance, that uh, make it clear that the freedmen can't share, or the way that it's pointed, um, the freedmen will never be able to share in the programs. These these are public these are public documents. They're on their websites. So it's it's not a matter of just somebody just sitting up here and saying it. So a lot of it comes down to the money, who's going to control the money, who's going to share in the money, as well as anti-blackness. Uh, you know, people running away from from blackness, wanting blacks to continue to stay on the bottom. Mm. Johnny J, I mean, you, you know, there is no competition, right? I mean, Native people have had it horrible on this continent. Black people, people of African descent have also had it horrible. Um, but it's so shocking and so disheartening to hear about the act of racism and, uh, aimed at Black Native Americans from their, from their own tribes. I mean, how prevalent are these attitudes, in, in your opinion? Um, I, I, because we know, for example, people who, white people, right, are, are usually raised to be racist, raised to be anti-black, raised to have this idea of, of white superiority. Um, but how prevalent are these attitudes from your experience in Indian country? I mean, is this, are these widely held attitudes? Are people overt with their racism as in certain examples as, as Marilyn has outlined? T tell us about what you have seen and heard. It is very prevalent. Like even when you look at our languages, um, in almost every tribal language, I can't remember who did it, but a couple uh, years ago, somebody put out on Twitter, like, how do you say black people in your language? And mm -hmm. a lot of the words that were put for that were put forth um, were very derogatory in the way that they were, like they're what they're what they were translated into in English. Um, like they actually meant the N word in our language. Like it wasn't just black person or black skin, like it translated to the N word. Um, and, you know, there was other ways that they described black people too, that were just so derogatory. And you're thinking like, wow, this is so prevalent, but you know, it's, it's, it's just like so ingrained, like you don't think anything of it either as a native person until you get older and you start learning about anti-blackness and you start kind of being exposed to other world views. Um, because from your perspective, if you're just growing up in your native language and you hear people using these words, you think that it just means black person. And you think that it just means, oh, they're describing black people, not realizing that they're using very anti-black language and have very black and, you know, anti-black ideals. And for me, you know, it was something that was very prevalent in my family growing up just anti-blackness in my community. Um, I do remember that I had a friend who was black and he had come to a homecoming game and he came with my friend Diana and I was just blown away about how people were so hostile to him that, that he was there and people just, I can't believe that she brought a black guy. I can't believe, you know, he had the nerve to come here. Like these were attitudes from the community, not even knowing him. And he was just there for a basketball game. And he was getting so much heat from just community members, just people giving him dirty looks, just treating him horrible. And I was sitting there like, wow, I never realized like it was this bad. Like I never realized that our community was so anti-Black, but then it started to click because, you know, our community was predominantly white and native. Like we, like, I think in all the years that I had gone to school there, I think we only had one black student and he was probably there for maybe not even a semester and he transferred out. And, you know, I think a lot of that has to do with the attitude that people have in the community towards black people. Like it's just so prevalent and it's not talked about in a way that, oh, it's bad. Like, <laughs> it's just kind of like normal, like, oh, this is the way it's always been. And, you know, people just kind of are so casual about it that, unless you are very tuned into it, like you kind of miss it for the most part. Like, you know, I, like even in my family, like 
I have like we have different tribal members um, that have married out and you know you go to different tribes and like for the Kiowa you know I was always very shocked when I heard you know when they were talking about black people they would say Kongion and I was thinking that's like to hear it it's just a native word but then once you start learning about anti-blackness you're realizing like oh that has a very derogatory um beginning and statement and when you look at how people treat black people and treat natives who have married black people and had kids it's terrible like it's (laughs) like my siblings are white passing um and white coded my Mom had, you know, with my stepdad, like he's white, she's native, and it was acceptable. Nobody batted an eye. But, you know, if you were a native woman who was dating a black guy or even married one, it was just a travesty in our tribe. Like people were just so upset about it and couldn't believe that it happened. And, you know, like, oh, where did we go wrong? Like these attitudes are just so prevalent in Indian country. And it's what has created this marginalized identity within a marginalized community because, you know, Native people are so invisible, but Black Natives are even more invisible. Um, I used to work for a Native fashion magazine, Native Max magazine. We were one of the only publications and one of the first to highlight Black Native people, to give them a platform and to show them as models. Because when you look at Native fashion, when you look at Native entertainment, you don't see Black Natives being highlighted. And we have so many who have like really just broke down some tremendous barriers and succeeded beyond what, you know, we could even believe, but yet they never get the recognition that they deserve because they're black and native and people will constantly try to invalidate their identity and say, well, they're not native, they're black. You know, it's, it's just something that is just so prevalent, so disgusting. And it's just a cycle that has been perpetuated because you know, for the way that the system is set up, you know, if there's a reason why these rifts have been put in between Black and Native people for us to have, you know, these ideas towards each other, misconceptions and everything. There's a reason. And that reason is because once we unify, once we mend those rifts, then we're that death blow to white supremacy. But the way that the system is set up right now is if we don't address anti-Blackness with the Indian country, then our sovereignty and our rights and justice for the Native community will always come at the expense of Black people Mm. and kind of vice versa. You know, if Black people were to get reparations without involving Native people and to imagine how that would look like, then it would come at the backs of Native people again. (laughs) So we're kind of constantly at odds. So there's a reason why solidarity is necessary and why we have to address anti-Blackness and anti-Indigeneity and find ways to mend these risks and make amends because you have to make amends. You have to make reparations, especially as Native people. Like we owe the freedmen a huge debt and we need to stop denying them (laughs) their birthright because until we do, then there's not gonna be justice. Like there's not gonna be um, a better way forward until we're able to work together. Mm -hmm. Antonio, what's it gonna, take to decolonize some of these attitudes? I mean, you you outlined the ways in which um, the five civilized tribes, which by the way, that phrase makes my skin crawl when I hear it because it's smack of white supremacy. Like, oh my God, the civilized tribes, holy shit. Um, But like, what's it going to take to sort of decolonize these attitudes? And mind you, I know white supremacy has done a number on all of us, even on white folks, right? Um, but for the purposes of, of this conversation, you know, we we see we have seen plenty of examples of, of Black and Native um, solidarity. But to overcome this hump of anti-Blackness and racism, in your opinion, what, what is it going to take? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to take work on on all sides. Um, I'll start, I start by saying, talking about this real quick, like even within uh, African-American communities here in Detroit, uh, even, like it happens a lot, it's all, this sort of debate also, also happens a lot on the blogosphere and Instagram spaces where young native folks are combating. Um, there tends to be a vibe and I, you know, I don't know if about, with your guys' experiences in uh, Southeastern United States, um, the, within the, the, what people would call hoteps, um, mm-hmm. of like 
African American folks who claim that all indigenous you know peoples are African, and um, so the, the, it gets there is a totalizing sort of uh, aspect to um, that, and I think that that becomes it's it's a minor problem. It's really not a problem. Uh, it's not because it has no power and has no real impact on like people. It's just like rhetoric. There's books. There's stories. It's conversations. Um, and, and sometimes I see some of that rhetoric as being useful in connecting shared struggles, shared histories. Um, but I think there is some like ideological things that need to happen on all sides in order for us to move forward in a good way. Uh, it is true and important to acknowledge that African people and native people have been exchanging, trading, communicating long before Columbus. Um, and it was actually like, and people, uh, from, you know, the Caribbean who said that, and it was documented by a number of the, uh, scholars and, and, and priests who, who came with Columbus that, uh, the native people of the Caribbean said, yeah, we receive, you know, black, there's dark skin, black people who came in and trade with us and communicated with us. They gave us like gold tip pointed spears. Um, there's a, there's a, there is a history of that and there is a relationship and there are many waves of people who have come to the Americas from, you know, Polynesian cultures, from uh, the Alaskan land bridge, from, you know, the Vikings came. I mean, the, many waves of people, you know, some of the Mediterranean empires probably came through, African empires came through. It's a good chance that Chinese people actually came through as well, um, some sort of Chinese empire. So, like, we have to acknowledge this long, complicated history uh, of people moving to different places. Um, and also recognize that colorism is something that we're dealing with, you know, within the African diaspora as well, heavily, heavily, constantly conversation that's happening around that. Um, so it's, 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 it's not something that's specific to, uh, you know, native communities or, I mean, it happens a lot in Puerto Rico too. Um, but I'd say a lot of this comes from this scarcity mindset that capitalism pushes out towards people, uh, that there's only so many resources, so we have to guard them and hoard them. There's only so much land, so we have to protect this. You know, um, they get the casinos and we didn't get any reparations. Like there's this, like this is the us versus them thing, which is so easy to play into. And it's very much so in the interest of the government, the United States, settler society for black and indigenous people to do that. And I think like we have to reframe the stories that we tell about ourselves, the histories that we uplift, not to erase anti-blackness or indigenous slave ownership or any of these things, because it's important to engage with those topics and remember them and discuss them and problematize them. But we have to think about the way that the logics of Christianity is about absorbing indigenous cultures and stripping them of their land-based practices. The logic of the United States has been about stripping away native cultures and native land. U.S. history has repeatedly, time and time again, taken away native people's land, African-Americans people's land, from the reconstruction to the 2008 financial crisis, which stripped 50% of black wealth, most of which came from the value of homes. This happens again and again in American history, where the United States strips black and brown people, indigenous people of their land, their cultures, their languages, their ancestry. And it's until the United States has some sort of truth and reconciliation with itself, and we're not trying to ban books, and we're not trying to like, you know, get away from the ethno, ethno fascism that Trump has been inspiring. I mean, that's the real enemy. That's the real problem. I mean, uh, that's the the one sad thing about Trump leaving office is like he was such an easy person for all of us to hate and for all of us to recognize as like, you know, the empire was naked and the king was flaccid and weak. And, and that was clear with Trump. But with with liberals like Biden, I think like people tend to forget that. But tell you Biden's going to give us, you know, reparations or anybody land, you know, the architect of mass incarceration, uh, one of the architects wrong with the, all the Clinton Democrat, neoliberal Democrats. Um, but we have to readjust our focus. Uh, we have to look at the stories that we tell about each other. We definitely shouldn't erase the intricacies of the things Marilyn is talking about because it's absolutely necessary that these uh, civilized tribes like begin to like decolonize themselves and, and remove you know the stain of white supremacy within their cultures and communities and societies and. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I battle that here and with Anishinaabe folks too. I mean, that's real. Like, I mean, I have like light skin 
white passing Anishinaabe folks, you know, telling me that they don't like what I do. They don't like that I build with Anishinaabe communities across the Great Lakes, um, that they, you know, don't think I'm native or I have X, Y, and Z rights to be in X, Y, and Z spaces. And sure, like I could tell those stories till, you know, my face turns blue and like, it, it's important. I prefer to tell them and talk about them when I'm with people of color. You're never going to catch me going around uh, talking and having these conversations openly with a bunch of white people because that's not necessarily their business, not necessarily the narratives and stories I want to be uplifting about our communities. Right. Um, so this is lateral violence and we got to deal with this among each other. Mm -hmm. Keep this in house. This is this is this is people of color's business and black folks' business and indigenous people business. We're gonna exclude the, the white folks out of the conversation. Y'all can watch, but y'all can't participate <laughs> at this point in time. Um, Marilyn, I, 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 the final point I, I wanted us to, to to hit before we wrap up um, has to do with this change.org petition. Dwayne, can we can we pop that up if we could? Um, encouraging Congresswoman. Deb Holland, who was the first Native woman to be elected to Congress, who is under consideration uh, for a cabinet position with the Biden administration um, to possibly head up the Department of the Interior. Um, black Native people are less than pleased with Congresswoman Holland because of her past comments surrounding de-enrollment. Talk to us about this petition, Marilyn, and, and what what is it that Black Indigenous people want here? Okay, what the Black Indigenous people would like to hear is for uh, uh, the Congresswoman or any other person that uh, is being considered for Interior or Assistant Secretary of Interior to uh, support the, uh, the use of the government. Uh, tools to enforce the 1866 treaties, uh, where uh, the, the, the situation with, with Congresswoman um, Holland is that um, she did not support uh, language uh, going into Indian housing bills, which would, um, how do I, how do I want to say it, tie whether or not a, an Indian tribe received federal funds, uh, depending on uh, whether they were uh, um, in compliance with their 1866 treaty obligations to a freedman descendants. Now, um, and so she did not support uh, language going on uh, some housing bills that are already out there. And we have, me, myself and the Congresswoman have even had conversation where she doesn't support um, Congress uh, doing uh, uh, passing laws in order to and you know enforce these treaty rights. Uh, now uh, she believes that um, she appears to believe that it's up to the tribes to uh, enforce the treaties, or possible federal agencies can do some things. But uh, you know this is this is this would be similar to some. Um, white congressperson back in 1950 saying, well, I don't think Congress ought to pass a law like the, you know, what eventually say became the Voting Rights or the Civil Rights Act. You know, those uh, states down there in Alabama and Mississippi, they need to get their own act together. Uh, it, it's on them. I mean, and that's what it sounds like to a person like myself, who's a member of a tribe, who has a a freedman ancestor who's of African Indian ancestry. Um, that's what it sounds like to us. And so before someone, before this position is filled, which is very important, the Secretary of Interior, before the position is filled, I think we, we need to make it clear what we want, what we expect. Uh, it's not enough that, it, that the person that fills this position be a, a member of a federal tribe. That's not enough. They're just going to do what the chiefs want. Some chiefs have really made it clear. Like the Choctaw chief who wrote a letter to the uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi that uh, if the freedmen are having economic or any kind of problems, hey, that's the federal government's fault. Not wanting to take any responsibility that the poor conditions of the Choctaw freedmen are the fault of the Choctaw nation or the Choctaw leadership 
or their current policy. That is in black and white. Wow. Johnny J, I got to get you in on this because whew, Maryland makes an amazing analogy there because it definitely smacks of a state's rights kind of argument, but the tribes <laughs> have a point too, right? We, we've discussed tribal sovereignty uh, many times. And is this a tribal sovereignty issue? Uh, do the tribes have the authority to actively discriminate against their black members, or can the federal government compel the tribes to adhere to these treaties? You know, if I'm always going to say if the tribe not. has taken, uh, if the tribe has signed, tribal leaders, they made a decision in 1866 in order to have their government government relationship that they would, uh, of what they would do. Uh, you know, regarding the people of African descent. The decision has already made, been made. A tribe has the right to limit their sovereignty to get something from the federal government, just as uh, tribes like the Pomonkeys over there on the East Coast. Uh, they, had, uh, they had laws where they would kick people out of the tribe if they married black people, but they wanted their federal recognition. So about 2014, they had to take that law down. Because people like Gwen Moore, other Congress people, they were opposing them uh, with this. So yes, a tribe can uh, limit their own sovereignty to get something that they want. Johnny J, let me. And let that's me get what you. they've done. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely I, agree with Marilyn because you know what I find happens quite a bit in these discussions is that a lot of Native people will hide behind sovereignty anti-blackness to them is a flex of sovereignty and it's absolutely not like if we can't honor our own treaties then how can we start talking about the u.s government not honoring theirs i mean this comes down to the whole crux of the matter in that indigenous people should be setting the example you know as soon as slavery was abolished we should have been the ones without a treaty even making reparations making amends with those that we harmed like that should have been just a given, but instead we were kind of forced into it with those treaties. And so a lot of what's going on now is a lot of these tribes feel that they are rebelling against the U.S. government by expelling the freedmen. Like to them, it's a flex and it shouldn't be. <laughs> and it shouldn't be something that we even view in that way because it harms so many people, um, so many of our people. And disenrollment is a huge issue right now because... We have tribes that are disenrolling so many tribal members that they only have maybe 20 people left in their entire tribe. And, you know, it's something that's a huge issue here in California with tribes disenrolling tribal members because of money, because a lot of tribes get per cap checks from casinos or other business endeavors. And for tribes that share that money with their people, there's a huge incentive to disenroll. And you see this playing out with the freedmen as well, because it does come down to money. You see the Choctaw people, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Cherokee have over five times the operating budget of the entire state of Oklahoma. They are some of the wealthiest tribes in the U.S., but they are very limiting in how they share that money. They have great programs. They have great hospitals. You know, they do a lot for local communities but they absolutely do decide who to share that money well, who to share that wealth with and how. Even as a Choctaw person who is living here in California, you know, I don't qualify for a lot of the benefits that a lot of other Choctaws do. You have to live in what they call a service area. And they use that to kind of exclude even other Choctaw people from being able to share in those benefits. And, you know, it's when you look at what's going on right now with like the anti-Blackness with them trying to use sovereignty as an excuse, like saying that we reserve the right to decide who is and who isn't Native. You know, that's absolutely true. But at the same time, you can't use that or abuse that power to discriminate against your own people. And, you know, as I've said time and time again, you know, the Cherokee, um, the Chickasaw, the Seminole, you know, all of these tribes, like the freedmen are our people and we cannot keep discriminating against them and using our sovereignty as some kind of weird flex to 
con continue being anti-Black and to continue discriminating against people. Like, that's not what sovereignty was intended for. It's not what, it was never um, a traditional value of ours. So, you know, it's something that we absolutely need to stop doing and to discuss more and to stop, like, as soon as you see somebody, I think, using that flex, like, oh, no, it's up to the tribes. And you need to be like, no, these were already decided by treaties. Treaties, mm -hmm. as we say all the time, are the supreme law of the land. So we need to abide by the treaties that we agree to, like 100%, no question, no arguing. Like if we want the U.S. to govern, the U.S. government to follow those treaties and to honor the treaties, then we have to do that too. And we should be setting the precedent, not just waiting. <laughs> Antonio, I'm, I'm gonna let you get the last word on, on this. Uh, is this an opportunity for the freedmen to place political pressure upon Congresswoman Holland or even on the Biden administration, you know, the, contingent upon um, her being confirmed as a potential interior secretary, uh, we have these demands of, of her once she enters this position. What is your take on tribal sovereignty versus, you know, the honoring of the treaties that, that included the freedmen into, these, into this um, nation? within any community where I'm not a part of how to organize and what they should be doing. I think Maryland is going to be the best to be strategizing around those issues and the, uh, the folks who are like, you know, on the ground uh, and um, you know, they're going to know best, but I'll tell you this, like, I don't like uh, giving up sovereignty. I don't like uh, asking the government for anything. I don't think like this situation and this divide empowers any of the community, any of the communities that we need to. Um, and I would say like those of us who consider ourselves leftists, young people, uh, tribal folks from across the country, um, you know, for my folks, you know, on both sides of the border in Kolotekan territory, um, we all need to like bear pressure on these tribal governments from other tribal communities because that's the kind of thing we need to be mobilizing uh, in our communities against the reactionary colonized mentality that exists within our own. You know, this is my call to action for all the other folks across the country to step in and weigh in as indigenous peoples against these governments that are stripping black indigenous people of their rights and their, and, and their resources. And I think desperately in the short term, we need to move beyond this conversation of you know, in, in black indigenous folks not getting accepted to like, how is it that black people and native people are just building together? And there's a surprising amount of indigeneity within African-American people that's unclaimed as well, include like, and this is like beyond the folks who like disrolled. So we need to get past that, this problem because the crabs in a barrel sort of stuff that we have happening now is gonna have us all boiling to death in the melting pot. And we don't have time. We just straight up don't have time to keep fucking around like this. Like, this is like climate chaos. We are in the empire of the world that's producing the most oil, that's pushing a neoliberal form of capitalism that is like destroying labor and searching for, you know, making capital free and people and, and labor is enslaved. We do not have time. We do not have time. The, the climate is not waiting. Fascists aren't waiting. The United States, you know, imp empire war machine is not waiting. And if we're all fighting each other over who is this or who isn't what, instead of building solidarity, instead of like trying to do something different, instead of reclaiming our cultures, reclaiming our languages, reclaiming our relationships with our ancestry and our motherlands, getting to our medicines, getting out to the land, sharing those medicines, sharing resources, that's the kind of stuff we need to be doing right now and fighting over who's in the club or who isn't or who belongs or who doesn't, you know, black, indigenous, brown, people of color in the United States, colonized people, people from the global South. We don't have time. We got to get past this because we have a lot of important work to do. And a lot of that's going to look like us building real relationships with each other, getting out on the land and doing work together, sharing medicines, sharing stories and, dancing, partying, eating, connecting, and building and fortifying ourselves for whatever, you know, chaos that's going to be coming next from this empire. 
We're going to leave the conversation right there. Well said. We've been speaking with Antonio Cosme. Antonio is an indigenous economist and activist, also a beekeeper in Detroit. We appreciate Antonio joining us. We've also been speaking today with Marilyn Van. Marilyn is the president of the Descendants of the Freedmen of the Five Civilized Tribe Association. She's been with us today from Oklahoma. And Johnny J, co-host of Decolonized News Hour, also indigenous activist and journalist, joining us us today from California. Panel, thank you so much. This was extremely educational and eye-opening, and, and I hope to continue to, to talk about this, but in the broader sense in which Antonio brought up, like how can Black and Indigenous start building together um, in, in order to not only survive, but um, thrive in, in this settler colonial state? Um, but there's a, there's a lot of work to be done, and we have to in the racism and intra-community discrimination. So I, I appreciate the three of you making some time to speak on this today. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Johnny. Take care, y'all. And listen, we appreciate you guys making some time for us for uh, for burning down with Kim Brown during your, your holiday um, time. We're not going to name the holiday because we don't all roll with the holiday the same way. And, and that's, and that's okay. But please remember COVID is still out here very much jumping on people. So please do what you can to keep your family and friends and yourself safe this holiday season, wear your mask, wash your hands, and just try to stay at home as much as you can. All right. We're going to see you guys next week. Have a good one. See you later. Bye.